springtime with you, making all things new. Your light is breaking like the dawn. This love it is sweeter than wine, bringing joy, bringing life. Hope it is rising like a song. Oh, this is what you do. This is what you do.
defense of God. Our help is in the name of God, maker, redeemer, sustainer of heaven and earth. The one who keeps us in the early morning and late in the night. And our God does love and care for all that God has made around the clock. God carries our planet and all other planets through the universe. God places the clouds in the sky. God causes rain to fall. God moves waters through canyons. God grows grasses and trees and sustains each and every living thing. That God created the earth out of love and joy is the story from the beginning of our sacred story. So let's find a way to act this out using the elements of our faith. Amen. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. In the beginning, God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together God called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, across the dome of the sky. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind, and it was so. Friends of God, this past week marked the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, a commitment made in San Francisco in 1970 by peace activists has turned into a day of global commitment to care for this planet. And we, as followers of Jesus, know that this kind of celebration is good and fitting. May we, on Earth Day and every day, be grateful to the one who is maker of this beautiful Earth and the universe within which our Earth sits. Amen. Amen. Let us approach God together with song.
Friends, in my Bible, Psalm 116 is called a prayer for thanksgiving for recovery from illness. And today, as we celebrate Earth Day, we do so at a time when we are very concerned about our human family and the illness we face, COVID-19. While some have recovered, we are in the middle of lament, for many have not. The experience that our human family is going through right now calls forth words like heaviness, trial, and struggle. We are in the middle of petitions for family, for friends, for workers, for communities. We seek recovery. It is not yet in our rear view mirror. But recovery has been granted over these past weeks in dramatic fashion. Recovery has been granted to the earth, and we can be thankful for that. Romans tells us that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. It has been in bondage to decay. It has been waiting eagerly for an awakening, for some freedom, for some glory. The hope is that the recovery of the earth and the recovery of humanity can go together. But today, anyway, let us be thankful for the way the world is in recovery, or at least getting a short-term reprieve during this period of human quarantining and social distancing. Maybe the sight of a happy, healthy earth can lead us to commit to long-term changes. Let us listen now to Psalm 116, as if the earth itself was praying this prayer of thanksgiving for healing. Let me say it again, as if the earth itself were praying this prayer of thanksgiving for healing to God. While we pray, let us view pictures that give evidence of that healing. I love the Lord because God has heard my voice and my supplications, because God inclined God's ear to me. Therefore, I will call on God as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. God of all to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. God of all to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, God saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. God of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. God are him of grateful praise. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What shall I return to the Lord for all God's bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all. God of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. God of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. 
friends of God this morning as inhabitants of God's earth, as part of the earth. We've let the earth speak its joy. And now here God greet us and God's entire creation. God says, the earth is mine and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. And I declare that it is very, very good. Grace to you and peace. Amen. Let us rise and praise God. God of all to thee we raise This our hymn of grateful praise God of all to thee we raise This our hymn of grateful praise Amen. The language of Scripture is filled with language of exile. The Israelites wandering, isolated in the wilderness, exiled from the land they had at one time fled to for safety, Egypt. Judah, exiled in Babylon, praying to return to Jerusalem. Judea and Galilee, isolated by oppressive Roman powers, not physically isolated from home, but restricted in ways that gave the experience of exile in one's own land. It is a good thing that our scriptures reflect exile and isolation, because our lives do as well. Long before COVID-19, we have, at times, found ourselves in exile, far from home. We have found ourselves isolated, trapped with no safe way out. So let us join together in a prayer of isolation and exile. Let us pray. God, we are in a collective moment of isolation, but it is not our first. We have, even before stay-at-home orders, found ourselves removed from healthy community, away from safe homes, stuck in places emotionally and physically, where we did not want to be. Sometimes we got there on our own, through our own actions and inactions. Sometimes we were victims of the actions and inactions of others. We remember those times of isolation and exile in silence. And we acknowledge the current moments of isolation, both the one forced upon us by this virus and all additional isolating realities in our lives. Amen.
Friends of God, hear the good news. The risen Christ does not wait for isolation to end to come and visit us. The disciples behind locked doors in fear were visited by a Christ who came to them where they were. A week later, they were still hiding in fear, and Christ came to them again. Christ Jesus will meet us in isolation, and Christ Jesus will not give up, breathing peace upon us until we really believe it and embody it and are led out of isolation and exile and into a community of shalom. Amen. As people made new by the everlasting God. Let us turn to scripture for guidance in right living. And hear these, teaching, these teachings today from 1 Peter. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Amen. Let's now stand uh, wherever you are and join in the memory verse that we have for the month of April. Lamentations 3.23. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
And friends, let's take a moment to pass the peace of Christ, to share a sign of peace with anyone who you might be with this evening in your household, or to share a greeting online, place a phone call, any way that you can express the peace of Christ. May it be with you and with the whole world. Amen. Friends of God, as we come back together for the word, both the word read and the word proclaimed, I just want to say that it is an honor to be able to continue preparing sermons for all of you. Um, when we're gathering here in person every week, if I'm the preacher of the week or Pastor Stephanie or Pastor Amos, we really spend the week not only reflecting on the text itself, but on you who are going to be hearing it. Um, believing that this living word from God is a word for you. And so in this time of isolation, though I'm looking out at empty pews right now, I'm not looking out at empty pews because each of you has been in my heart and mind this week as I've heard this word and tried to make sense of it in a way that, that speaks to you. I'd also say that this has given a, a unique opportunity to imagine people in the pews who've never been in our pews before. So in addition to preaching the sermon for those who are our RCHP family, I'm reminded that God's family is far larger. Every week we say in this place, this is God's house and all are welcome here. Maybe in some unique way, all are welcome here can be extended a little further because of this moment of isolation. So all are welcome here. Let's join now in prayer before Ian shares with us the text from Luke chapter 24. God, thank you for gathering us in this place. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The scripture lesson today is from Luke 24, 13 through 35. Listen for the word of God speaking to you. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. 
but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. When he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recog recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he was appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. We are we are a full two weeks past Easter now. The cross in this sanctuary that was transformed from mired wire on Good Friday to spring daisies on Easter Sunday has been put away until next year. The empty tomb confirmed for us that Jesus is risen. But the lectionary text for this week encourages us to linger a little longer, to stay near the stories of Easter, of Easter Day. And today I want to stay there, hanging out around Jerusalem on Easter, because we should know all the Easter stories. Our faith clings generally to the witness accounts of the resurrected Christ on Easter morning. We live retelling the story of Mary Magdalene and the other women, those faithful disciples finding an empty tomb and rushing to tell everyone with excitement. But sometimes we are a lot more like Cleopas and the other disciple on the road to Emmaus. Theirs is an Easter story too, Easter afternoon. Who? Cleopas is an otherwise unnamed disciple of Jesus. Our Orthodox and Catholic siblings in the faith claim that he was the brother of Joseph, Jesus' father. Other traditions say that he was the father of one or more of the disciples. We really don't know who he was. And who is the other disciple? Is it a woman? Is it a man? Why isn't this one named? Neither of them are among the 12 apostles, for later in the story they return to Jerusalem to see the 11, and by this time Judas is out of the picture. We know of other disciples, women and men who've followed from Galilee and elsewhere. These two must have been part of that larger group. What were these two disciples doing then on a day when Jesus' body was missing and some were excited and others were puzzled and scared? Why were they leaving the city alone? They just finished following a populist leader who in the past week had become a super scandalous populist leader, so concerning to the authorities that he'd been hung on a cross. Most of the disciples we hear were hiding out in Jerusalem trying to figure out what to do, but not these folks. Were they just out and about that day? No. I don't imagine these two were just out for a walk when we hear about them on the road. I think they were walking home. I think they're from the town called Emmaus, seven miles outside the city of Jerusalem. I'm totally speculating here, but I think they are a couple. 
I imagine a husband and a wife, followers of Jesus, walking home, walking home devastated. As I read this story this week, all I could think of was Bruce Springsteen's song, Long Walk Home. Last night I stood at your doorstep Trying to figure out what went wrong You just slipped something into my palm And then you were gone I could smell the same deep green of summer Above me the same night sky was glowing In the distance I could see the town where I was born It's gonna be a long walk home They were heading home, only seven miles But home was not where their hearts were It was going to be a long walk home. Their hearts were with Jesus, but he was gone. It was going to be a long walk home. Some of the followers who had gone to the tomb in the morning came back with a story of angel sightings and a promise from them that Jesus is alive. But when others went to confirm it, they couldn't. His body was gone, yes, but there were no angels, no confirmation that this was anything other than further denigration of Jesus. Someone stole the body. It was going to be a long walk home. Just as they got out of town, a fellow traveler joined them on the road. This traveler could tell that they were forlorn. What happened, he said. And Cleopas responded by saying, you must be the only traveler in these parts who didn't hear what happened on Friday. And he told all about Jesus and their hopes that he was the Messiah and the dashing of those hopes when he hung on a cross. And they shared, too, about the confusion of the morning, an empty tomb, an angelic visit, but no confirmation. They were heading home. And then Jesus, this unnamed traveler who in his resurrected body was not immediately recognizable, said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and slow of heart not to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Those are pretty daring words for a traveling companion, I think call them foolish in their forlorn state. I imagine, though, that as he said it, that he said it gently, for they remained open to his companionship on their long walk home. And then Jesus started, we are told, opening up the Hebrew scriptures, sharing how the promised Messiah would suffer. Starting with Moses, he pointed to all the times when God's liberation included suffering leadership. And I wonder if he pointed to Moses' birth, born in suffering, hidden in bulrushes. I wonder if he pointed to Moses on the run after he defended an Israelite, killing a guard. I wonder if he pointed to Moses risking it all, demanding Pharaoh to let his people go and suffering the tremendous and regular backlash of Pharaoh's revenge, only to have God triumph in the end. I wonder if he pointed to the suffering in the wilderness and Moses' pained suffering leadership on the way to the promised land. We're told he was quoting Moses and the prophets, and I imagine he must have quoted Isaiah a bunch that day as they walked. I imagine him saying to Cleopas and his wife, haven't you heard Isaiah 52? See, my servant shall prosper. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. I bet he told them Isaiah 53, Surely he's borne our iniquities and carried our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he'd done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Out of his anguish he shall see light powerful testimonies of suffering as part of redemption. I'm sure Jesus shared from those prophetic texts, and I wonder what other verses he pointed to. I wonder. It seems to me that Jesus, in his preparation for what would occur in his own life, has shaped himself in the motif of the suffering servant, a motif running deep through his ancient texts. 
And he was able on that walk to Emmaus without a Bible in hand to share from memory the passages that reflected his identity. He was able to open the pages, if you will, about messianic suffering to two travelers who needed to hear it. Hearing these texts brought comfort and it stirred the hearts of the two travelers. We're not told until we're not told that until later in the story, but eventually they say, "We're not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us." So even as they were traveling away from Jerusalem, their hearts were coming back because Jesus, unfolding truths about himself, was with them. One reason that I think Emmaus is their hometown is because when they reached it, and Jesus appeared to be traveling on, they invited him in to stay with them for a meal and for rest. So they had a house there and a kitchen and could offer hospitality, hospitality that Jesus accepted. And as they sat for that meal, Jesus took the bread. That's what a host is supposed to do. But Jesus took it in their house and broke it And immediately their eyes were opened and they recognized him. I wonder if he said, this is my body broken for you. I bet he didn't need to say a thing. The action itself of him lifting up bread and breaking it was louder than words. And then he vanished. Cleopas and the other disciple returned that very night to Jerusalem. Seven miles felt like nothing. It was going to be a long walk home to Emmaus, but Jesus' companionship made the time go faster And now the way back to Jerusalem was a virtual sprint. When they arrived, they learned that Peter, too, somehow, on that same day, had also interacted with Jesus. Peter, too, had been walking home or retreating somewhere, and Jesus had met him and changed his direction. Jesus was meeting them, each of them, where they were and bringing them back together. He wasn't letting them get away. Friends of Christ, it wasn't just on that first sad, confusing Easter Sunday afternoon that disciples felt the need to go back to their old lives, to give up on the hope of a Messiah who announced a coming kingdom of shalom. Have you ever felt that way? The experience of faithful disciples having their hopes dashed, feeling absent from God, absent from Christ, sounds awful familiar because... Sometimes it's our story. Sometimes even, though I am your pastor, it's my story too. For those who are fully invested in following Christ Jesus, the one who, those who claim Christ as risen Savior and who long for the coming kingdom and work for it, the failure to see it unfold is frequently devastating. Sometimes it feels like it's going to be a long walk home. Not every day is a day when faithful disciples can see the power and presence of the Messiah. Sometimes it feels like we are on a long walk home and we're heading there to climb into bed and not get out, to bury our head in our pillow. Sometimes it feels like we're heading down Emmaus Road to climb into our own tombs for the life has gone out of us, gone out of our community, and it all just feels too hard and impossible and we are exhausted. The kingdom of God that the risen Christ said was at hand, almost close enough to touch, so often seems dashed. We could risk feeling that way now. We haven't had the death penalty in New Jersey in decades, and yet jails and prisons unable to handle COVID-19 are becoming death sites for people in prison. We try to care for the elderly and weak, but nursing home residents are becoming first casualties of COVID-19. We fight against sinful immigration policies year after year, and instead of winning, we see detention and deportation as one of the leading spreaders of this pandemic as we set to flight thousands of infected immigrants, infected here, now bringing the virus to communities everywhere. We fight for immigrant worker rights, and instead, immigrants do essential work during a pandemic and still have to do it looking over their shoulder for ICE agents waiting at the edge of the field. We had hoped 
that Christ was the one who redeemed us and set us on a right path. But it is instead a long walk home. What happened? But the beautiful message for us today isn't that all our problems go away because Christ was raised from the dead. The beautiful message isn't that the kingdom has suddenly fully arrived and justice is realized. That would be a lie. It hasn't been realized. We live in the in-between times, and those times include hurt. They include shattered dreams. Instead, the good news today is that we do not need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps or get ourselves together or snap out of it. Instead, rather, the good news is that the Christ who is raised from the dead by the power of God cares enough about each and every one of us to meet us on the roads that we are taking away from hope, away from the coming kingdom of God. And the Christ who meets us, meets us where we are at, walking alongside us, opening the scriptures to us, scriptures that allow us to see new possibilities, dead stumps with new shoots, dry streams that again have water, floods that recede and allow olive branches to be brought to an ark. The Christ who meets us can come to us gently, not overwhelming us, but can rather travel with us for a while, spoon-feeding us until we're ready to see and experience again that our hearts are warm and our bodies are being fed by the risen Christ who does not run from suffering, but rather enters suffering and triumphs over it by going through it. Christ is our refuge and strength on our roads away. It was going to be a long walk home. But now it's not, because Christ journeys with us. Christ won't let us go. And when we're ready, when our hearts can take it, Christ will reveal God's love and victory in such a way that we can rush back to Jerusalem and join the other disciples and encourage them and take on the powers of death. Are you, friends of God, on a long walk home at this time in your life? If so, keep your eye out for a fellow traveler, one who you might not fully recognize, Listen for still small voices and refuge-like kindness and fully expect if you make it all the way home, you might not be staying there too long for you're needed back in our Jerusalem. After Christ takes the bread and feeds you and nourishes your soul and heart, you're going to want to hustle back, back to the center of God's transforming work in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, thank you so much for your, your word. Thank you for stories, even on Easter itself, that speak of people in retreat. And thank you for stories, even on Easter itself, that tell us of a God, a Christ, who pursues us. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us now prepare to give of our tithes and offerings.
God, thank you for promising to never leave us or forsake us. And thank you for going one step farther and meeting us where we are. On our roads away from Jerusalem, on our roads away from suffering. And thank you for feeding us and sending us back to be agents of hope and change. May our gifts of, um, of money and of prayer and of service be of use for your work of strengthening the world. Thank you for being our strength. Amen. Friends, as we all try to stay in touch with each other and keep up with different opportunities, I encourage you to check the church website frequently, www.rchighlandpark.org. You'll find many different opportunities to gather online throughout the week, and I especially want to call your attention to a few things that will be happening on Sunday. At 10.30 on Sunday morning, there will be children's worship. At 12 noon, there is Indonesian worship, and also at 12 noon, there is virtual coffee hour via Zoom. So we invite you to participate in as many of those as you are able to. Let's turn now to God in prayer. Let us pray. And growth. You continually renew us by your spirit and wash over us with living waters. You sent Jesus to us so that we might have life and have it in abundance. You nourish our bodies and our souls. But you know, O oh God, that things hinder our growth from time to time. Hear us as we ask you to remove anything that inhibits life. Hear our prayers for those who are sick, those who are providing medical care, those who are grieving, those who are isolated. Be with those who bear heavy burdens and lighten their loads, that they might grow into the life that you have for them. We call to mind all who are in special need of your care. God of life, despite the challenges that we face and the struggles of our world, still we see your presence beside us. Still we rejoice in the lives that you have given us. We praise you for your resilient love, which comes back to us time and time again. Thank you for taking up our brokenness and making of us something beautiful. Thank you for nurturing seeds of life within us and within all people. We call to mind our reasons for gratitude. Everlasting God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, for always being ready to receive our joys and our concerns. We lift up our voices and join together wherever we are in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends of God, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Go in peace to love and to serve. Amen. Trying to, it's still up. It's just, uh, there we go. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. Comfort